Do you wonder where poetry comes from? Where we get the songs we sing and the tales we tell? Do you ever ask yourself how it is that some people can dream great, wise, beautiful dreams and pass those dreams on as poetry to the world? To be sung and retold as long as the sun rises and sets? As long as the moon will wax and wane. Have you ever wondered why some people make beautiful songs and poems and tales, and some of us do not? It is not long, it is a long story, and it does no credit to anyone. There is murder in it, and trickery, lies, and foolishness, seduction, and pursuit. It began not long after the dawn of time, in a war between the gods. The Asir fought the Vanir. The Asir were warlike gods of battle and conquest. The Vanir were softer brother and sister gods, and goddesses who made the soils fertile and the plants grow, but none the less powerful for that. The gods of the Vanir and the Asir were too well smashed. Neither side could win the war, and more than that, as they fought, they realized that each side needed the other. That there is no joy in a brave battle unless you have fine fields and farms to feed you in the feasting that follows. They came together to negotiate a peace, and once the negotiations were concluded, they marked their truce by each of them, Asir and Vanir alike, one by one spitting into a vat. As they spit mingled, so was their agreement made binding. Then they had a feast, food was eaten, mead was drunk, and they caroused, and joked, and talked, and boasted, and laughed, as the fires became glowing coals until the sun crept up above. 
above the horizon, then as the Asir and the Veneer rouse themselves to sleep, to wrap themselves in furs and cloth and set out into the crisp snow and the morning mist. Odin said, It would be a shame to leave our mingled spittle behind us. Frey and Freya, brother and sister, were leaders of the Vanir, who would say, with the Asir in Asgard from now on, until the terms of the truce, they nodded. We can make something from it, said Frey. We should make a man, said Freya, and she reached into the vat. The spittle transformed and took shape as her fingers moved, and in moments it had taken on the appearance of a man and stood naked before them. You are Kvasir, said Odin. Do you know who I am? You are Odin all highest, said Kvasir. You are Grimnir and third. You have other names, to many to list in this place, but I know them all, and I know the poems and the chants and the kennings that go with them. Kvasi, made of the adjoining of the Asir and the Vanir, was the wisest of the gods. He combined head and heart, the gods jostled each other to be the next to ask him questions, and his answers to them were always wise. He observed keenly, and he interpreted what he saw correctly soon enough. Gvasir turned to the gods and said, I am going to travel now. I am going to see the nine worlds, see Midgard. There are questions to be answered that I have not yet been asked. But you will come back to us, they asked. I will come back, said Kvasir. There is the mystery of the net, after all, which one day will need to be untangled. The what? asked Thor. But Kvasir merely smiled, and he left the gods puzzling over his words, and he put on a travelling cook, and he left Asgard and walked to the Rainbow Bridge. Gvasir went from town to town, from village to village. He met all kinds, and he treated them all them well, and answered their questions. And there was one not a place, but was the better for Gvasir's stopping. In those days there were two dark elves who lived in a forest by the sea. They did magic there and feats of alchemy. Like all dwarves, they built things. Wonderful, remarkable things in their workshop and their forge. But there were things they had not yet made and making those things obsessed them. They were brothers, and were called Fjallna and Gala. When they heard that Kvasir was visiting a town nearby, they set out to meet him. Fjallna and Gala found Kvasir in the great hall, answering questions for the townsfolk, amazing all who listened. He told the people how to purify water and how to make cloth from nettles. He told one woman exactly who had stolen her knife and why, once he was done talking and the townsfolk had fed him, the dwarves approached. We have a question to ask you that you have never been asked before, they said, but it must be asked in Will you come with us? I will come, said Kvasir. They walked to the fortress. The seagulls screamed, and the brooding grey clouds were the same shade as the grey of the waves. The dwarves led Kvasir to their workshop, deep within the walls of their fortress. What are those? asked Kvasir. They are vats. They are called Sun and Bowden. I see. And what is that over there? 
How can you be so wise when you do not know these things? Is it? It is a kettle. We call it an odrerir, ecstasy giver. And I see over there you have a bucket of honey you have gathered. It is uncapped and liquid. Indeed we do, said Fiala. Gala looked scornful. If you were as wise as they say you are, you would know what our question to you would be before we asked it. And you would know what these things are for. Kvasin nodded in a resigned way. It seemed to me, he said, that if you were both intelligent and evil, you might have decided to kill your visitor and let his blood flow into the vat's sun and bone. And then you would heat his blood gently in your kettle, O Durir. And after that, you would blend uncapped honey into the mixture and let it ferment until it became mead, the finest mead, a drink that will intoxicate anyone who drinks it, but also gives anyone who tastes it the gift of poetry and the gift of scholarship. We are intelligent, admitted Carla, and perhaps there are those who might think us evil. And with that, he slashed Kvasir's throat, and they hung Kvasir by his feet above the vats until the last drop of his blood was drained. They warmed the blood and the honey in the kettle, called Odred and did other things to it of their own devising. They put berries into it, and stirred it with a stick. It bubbled, and it then ceased bubbling, and both of them sipped it and laughed, and each of the brothers found the verse and the poetry inside himself that he had never let out. The gods came the next morning. Gavasir, they said, he was the last seen with you. Yes, said the dwarves. He came back with us. But he went, but when he realized that we are only dwarves and foolish and lacking in wisdom, he choked on his own knowledge. If only we had been able to ask him questions. He died, you say? Yes, said Fiala and Gala. And they gave the gods Kvasa's blownless body to take back to Asgard for a god's funeral, and perhaps because gods are not as others, and death is not always permanent for them, for gods eventually return. Thus it was that the dwarves had the mead of wisdom and poetry, and any person who wished to taste it needed to beg it from the dwarves. But Gala and Fiala gave the mead only to those they liked. And they liked nobody but themselves. Still, there were those to whom they had obligations, the giant Gilling, for example, and his wife. The dwarves invited them to come and visit their fortress, and one winter's day they came. Let us go rowing in our boat, the dwarves told Gilling. The giant's weight made the boat ride low in the water, and the dwarves rowed the boat on the rocks just under the surface. Always before their boat had floated serenely above the rocks, not this time, the boat crashed onto the rocks and overturned, throwing the giant into the sea. Swim back to the boat, the brothers called to Gilling. I cannot swim, he said, and that was the last thing he said, for a wave filled his open mouth with salt water, and his head hit the rocks, and in a moment he was lost to view. Fiala and Gala righted their boat and went home. Gilling's wife was waiting for them. Where is my husband? he asked. She asked. Him, said Carla. Oh, he's dead. Drowned, added Fiala helpfully. 
at this giant's wife wailed and sobbed as if each cry were being ripped from her soul. She called to her dead husband and swore she would love him always, and she cried and moaned and wept. Hush, said Gala. Your weeping and wailing hurts my ears. It's very loud. I expect that's because you're a giant. But the giant's wife simply wept the louder. Here, said Fiala, would it help if we showed you the place where your husband died? She sniffed and nodded and cried and wailed and keened for her husband who would never come back to her. Stand just over there and we will point it out to you, said Fiala showing her exactly where pardon me showing her exactly where she should stand that she should go through the great door and stand beneath the wall of the fortress and she nod and he nodded to his brother who scurried off up the steps to the wall above. As Gilling's wife walked through the door, Gala dropped a huge stone on her head, and she fell, her skull half crushed. Good job, said Fiala. I was getting very tired of those dreadful noises. pushed the woman's lifeless body off the rocks and into the sea. The fingers of the grey waves dragged her body away from them, and Gilling's wife and Gilling were reunited in death. The dwarves shrugged and believed themselves to be extremely clever in their fortress by the sea. They drank the mead of the poetry each night, and acclaimed great and beautiful verses to each other, made mighty sagas about the death of Gilling and Gilling's wife, which they declaimed from the rooftop of their fortress, and eventually each night they slept, insensible, and woke where they had sat down or fallen the night before. One day they awoke, as usual, but they did not wake in their fortress. They woke on the floor of their boat, and a giant, whom they did not recognize, was rowing it into the waves. The sky was dark with storm clouds, and the sea was black. The waves were high and rough, and the salt water splashed over the side of the dwarf's boat, soaking them. Who are you? asked the dwarves. I am Satang said the giant. I heard you were bragging to the wind and the waves and the world about ki having killed my father and mother. Ah, said Gala, does that explain why you have tied us up? It does, said Sutting. Perhaps you were talking us, you were taking us to a glorious place, said Fiala hopefully. Where you will unite us, and there we will feast and drink and love and become the best of friends. I do not believe so, said Satang. It was low tide. There were rocks jutting out above the water. They were the same rocks upon which at night side, night at, at which at high tide, the dwarves' boat had overturned, on which Gilling had drowned. Satang Ping picked up each of the dwarves, took him from the bottom of the boat, and placed him on the rocks. 
These rocks will be covered by the sea at the high tide, said Yalfa, yeah, Fiala. <coughs> our hands are tied behind our backs, we cannot swim. If you leave us here, we will undoubtedly drown. That is certainly the intention, said Stung. He smiled then for the first time. As you, and as you drown, I shall sit in this, your boat, and I shall watch the sea take you both. Then I shall return home to Jotunheim, and I will tell my brother, Baogi, and my daughter, Gunnlod, how you died, and we will be satisfied that my mother and my father were appropriately avenged. The sea began to rise. It covered the dwarves' feet and then it came up to the navels. Soon enough the dwarves' bared beards were floating in the foam, and there was a panic in their eyes. Mercy, they called. Like the mercy you gave my mother and my father, we will compensate you for their deaths. We will make it up to you. We will pay you. I do not believe that you dwarves possess anything that could compensate me for my parents' death. I am a wealthy giant. I have many servants in my mountain fastness and all the riches I could dream of. God, I have and precious stuff. Have and precious stones and iron enough to make a thousand swords. I am the master of mighty magics. What could you give me that I do not already have? asked Satang. The dwarf said nothing at all. The waves continued to rise. We have made the made of poetry. Sputtered Galar as the water brushed his lips. Made of Kvasir's blood, wisest of all the gods, shouted Fiala. Two vats and a kettle all filled with it. No one has it but us, no one in the world. Satang scratched his head. I must think about this. I must ponder, I must reflect. Do not stop and think if you think we will drown, shouted Fiala. Over the roar of the waves, the tide rose, waves were splashing over the dwarves' heads, and they were gulping air, and their eyes were round with fear, when Satong the giant reached out and plucked first Fiala and then Gala from the waves. The meat of poetry will be an adequate compensation, it is a fair price if you throw in a few other things. And I am sure you dwarves have a few other things. I shall spare your lives. He tossed them, still bound and soaking into a bottom of the boat. They were wriggled uncomfortably like a couple of bearded lobsters, and he rowed back to the shore. Satan took the mead the dwarves had made from Kivas's blood. He took other things from them as well, and he left that place and left those dwarves who are all things considered happy enough to have got away with their lives. Fiala and Gala told people who passed their fortress the story of how ill-used they had been by Satang. They told it in the market when the next they went to trade. They told it when ravens were near. In Asgard, at his high seat, Odin sat, and his ravens, Hugin and Munin, whispered to him of the things they had seen and heard as they had wandered the world. Odin's one eye flashed when he heard the tale of Satang's mead. The people who had heard the story called the mead of poetry the ship of the dwarf. Since it had floated Fiala and Gala off the rocks and taken them safely home, they called it Satung's Mead. They called it the liquid of Odre and Bolden and Son. 
Odin listened to his raven's words. He called for his cloak and his hat. He sent for the gods and told them to prepare three enormous wooden vats, the largest vats that they could lit build, and to have them waiting by the gates of Asgard. He told the gods he would be leaving gate, leaving them to walk the world, and might be some time. I will take two things with me, said Odin. I need a whetstone to sharpen a blade with the finest we have here, and I wish to have the ogre, the drill, called Rati. Rati means drill, and Rati was the finest drill the gods possessed. It could drill deeply and drill through the hardest rock. Odin tossed the wet stone into the air and caught it again, and put it into his pouch beside the ogre. Then he walked away. I wonder what he's going to do, said Thor. Kvasir would have known, said Frigg. He knew everything. Kvasir is dead, said Loki. As for me, I do not care where the Allfather is going, or why. I am off to help build the wooden vat that the Allfather requested, said Thor. Satang had given the precious mead to his daughter, Gunnar to watch over inside the mountain called Hnitborg Bjorg yeah. Hnitborg Hnitborg in the heart of the giant country Odin did not go to the mountain. Instead, he went directly to the farmland owned by Satang's brother, Baugi. He was spring, it was spring and the fields were high with grasses to be cut for hay. Baugi had nine slaves, giants like himself, and they were cutting the grass for hay with huge scythes, each scythe the size of a small tree. Odin watched them when they stopped work, when the sun was at the highest to eat their provisions. Odin sauntered over to them and said, I have been watching you all work. Tell me, why does your master let you cut grass with such blunt scythes? Our blades are not blunt, said one of the workers. Why would you say that? asked another. Our oh, blades are the sharpest. Let me show you what a well sharpened blade can do, said Odin. He took the wet stone from his pouch and drew it along first one side of the blade, then another until the blade glimmered in the sun. The giant stood around him awkwardly, watching him as he worked. Now, said Odin, try them out. The giant slaves swept their scythes through the meadow grass and grasped and gasped and exclaimed with pleasure. The blades were so sharp they made cutting the grass effortless. The blades swept through the thickest stalks and met with no resistance. This is wonderful, they told Odin. Can we buy your whetstone? Buy it, said the old father, absolutely not. Let us do something more fair and more fun. All of you, come here. Stand in a group, each man holding his side tightly. Stand closer. We can stand no closer, said one of the giant slaves, for the sides are very sharp. You are wise, said Odin. He held up the wet stone, I tell you this. The one of you who catches it, he alone shall have it. And so saying, he tossed the whetstone into the air. Nine giants jumped to the whetstone. As it descended, each reaching with his free hand, paying no attention to the scythe he held. Each scythe with a blade sharpened.
by the All-Father at his whetstone wetted to a perfect sharpness. They jumped and they reached and the blades glinted in the sun. There was a spray and a spurt of crimson in the sunlight, and the bodies of the slaves crumpled and twitched, and alone, one by one, fell to the freshly cut grass. Odin stepped over the bodies of the giants, which wreathed the wet stone of the gods, and placed it back into his pouch. Each of the nine slaves had died with his throat cut by a fellow blade. Odin walked to the hall of Baugi, Satang's brother, and asked for lodging for the night. I am called Balvakir, said Ad Odin. Balvakir, said Baugi, a dismal name, it means worker for terrible things. Only to my enemy, said the person who called himself Balvakir, my friends appreciate things I do can do the work of nine men, and I will work tirelessly and without complaint. Lodging for the night is yours, said Baugi, sighing, but you have to come to me on a dark day. Yesterday I was a rich man with many fields and with nine slaves to plant and to harvest, to labour and to build. Tonight I still own my fields and my animals, but all my servants are dead. They slew each other, I do not know why. A dark day, indeed. And Blot, Balvakir, who is Odin, can you not get another workman? Not this year, sighed Balgi. It is already spring, the good workers are already working for my brother Satang, and few enough people come here in the way of drought things. You are the first traveller who has asked me for lodging and hospitality in many a year. And lucky you are that I did, for I can do the work of nine men. You are not a giant, said Balgi. You are a little shrimp of a thing. How could you do the work of one of my servants, let alone nine of them? If I cannot do the work of your nine men, said Bolvakir, then you need not pay me, but if I do, yes, even in distant parts we have heard tales about your brother Satung's extraordinary we made. They say it bestows the gift of poetry on anyone who drinks it. This is true, Satung was never a poet when we were young. I was the poet in the family, but since he has returned with the dwarves mead, he has become a poet and a dreamer. If I work for you and plant and build and harvest for you and do the work of your dead servants, I would like to taste your brother's Satung's mead. But Baugi's forehead decreased. But that is not mine to give, it is Satung's. A pity, said Bolvakir. And I wish you luck in getting the harvest in this year. Wait, it is not mine true, but if you can do what you say, I will go with you to see my brother Satang, and I will do all I can to help you taste his meat. Then, said Paul, okay, we have a deal. Never was there a harder worker than Bolvakir. He worked and learned the land harder than twenty men, let alone nine. Single-handed, he looked after the animals. Single-handed, he harvested the crops, the workers, the land. He worked the land, and the land repaid him a thousandfold. Bovakir said Baugi as the first mist rolled down the mountain. You are misnamed, for you have worked nothing but good. Have I done the work of nine men? You have a nine again. Then will you help me get the taste of Satung's mead? I shall. 
The next morning they rose early and walked and walked and walked and by evening they had left Baugi's land and reached Satang's on the edge of the mountains. By nightfall they reached Satang's huge full hall. Greetings brother Satang and Baugi, said Baugi. This is Bolvakir, my servant for the summer and my friend. And he told Satang of his agreement with Bolvakir. So you see, he concluded, I must ask you to give him a taste of the mead of poetry. Satang's eyes were the chips of ice. No, he said flatly. No, said Baugi. No, I will not give away a single drop of that mead. Not one drop. I have it safe in the vats, in bone and sun, and the kettle Odysir. Odysir. Those vats are kept deep inside the mountain of the Hittenborg, which opens only to my command. My daughter Gunnlod guards it. This servant of yours cannot taste it. You cannot taste it. But, said Balgi, it was blood compensation for our parents' deaths. Don't I deserve the smallest measure of it? To know Bolv to show Bolvakir here that I am an honourable giant. No, said Salang, you don't. They left his hall. Baugi was disconsolate. He walked with his shoulders hunched high and his mouth dropped down. Every few paces Baugi would apologize to Bolvakir. I did not think my brother would be so unreasonable, he would say. He is indeed unreasonable, said Bolvakir. It was Odin in disguise, I know, you don't need to tell me. But you and I could play a little trick or two on him, so that he would not be so high and mighty in future, so that next time he will listen to his brother. We could do that, said the giant Balgi, and he stood straighter, and the corners of his mouth tightened into something that almost resembled a smile. What are we going to do? First, said Bolvakir. We will climb Hittenborg, the beating mountain. They climbed Hitt Nip Nipborg together. Nip Nip York. I'm going to just call it Nipborg. Um, the giant going first, and Bolvacure, doll sized in comparison, never falling behind. They clambered up the paths that the mountain sheep and goats made, and then they scrambled up rocks until they were high in the mountains. The first snows of winter had fallen on the ice that had not melted from the winter before. They heard the wind as it whistled about the mountain. They heard the cries of birds far below them, and there was something else they could hear. It was a noise like an, a human voice. It seemed to be coming from the rocks of the mountain, but it was always distant, as if it were coming from inside the mountain itself. What noise is that? said Bolvakir. Baugi frowned. It sounds like my niece Gunnlod singing. Said Bulky, that we 
must keep drilling. That is only one thing, said Balki, but Bobbika said nothing more on that high mountainside, where the icy winds clawed and clutched at them. Balki pushed the drill, ratty, back into the hole and began to turn it once more. It was getting dark when Balki pulled the auger from the hole again. It broke through into the inside of the mountain. Said nothing, but he blew gently into the hole, and this time he saw the chips of rock blow inward. As he blew, he, he was aware that something was coming towards him from the behind. Bolfiger transformed himself. Then he turned himself into a snake, and the sharp out auger plunged into the place where his head had been. The second. Taylor. 
she had food there in the mountain and drink and they ate and they drank after they ate they kissed gently in the darkness after their love making Bovicus said sadly I wish I could taste one more sip of the mead from the vat called Son then I could make a true song about your eyes and all men would sing it when they wanted to sing of beauty one sip she asked a sip so small nobody would ever know he said but I am in no hurry you are more important than that let me show you how important to me you are and he pulled her to him they made love in the darkness when they had finished and were curled up together naked skin touching skin whispering in demons then Bovicus sighed mournfully. What is wrong? asked Gunnar. I wish I had the skill to sing of your lips, how soft they are, how much better they are than the lips of any other girl. I think that would be an excellent song. That is indeed unfortunate, agreed Gunnar. For my lips are very attractive. I often think they are my best feature. Perhaps, but you have so many perfect features. Picking the best is so difficult. But if I were to take the tiniest taste from that that cool boat, the poetry would enter my soul and I'd be able to make a poem about your lips that would last until the sun is eaten by a wolf. Only the tiniest sip, though, she said, because father would get quite irritable if he thought I was giving away his meat to every good-looking stranger who penetrated this mountain fastness. They walked the caverns, holding hands and occasionally brushing lips. Gunnold showed both the kid the doors and the windows that she could open from the inside. through which Satong sent her food and drink, and Bovagir appeared to pay no attention. He explained that he was not interested in anything that was not about Gunnlod, or her eyes, or her lips, or her fingers, or her hair. Gunnlod laughed and told him that he did not mean any of his fine words, and he obviously did not want to make love with her again. He hushed her lips with his lips, and once again they made love. When they were both perfectly satisfied, Bovagir began to weep in the darkness. What's wrong, my love? asked Gunnlod. Kill me, sobbed Bovagir. Kill me now, for I will never be able to make a poem about the, perf the perfection of your hair and your skin, of the sound of your voice, of the feel of your fingers, the beauty of Gunnlod. It is impossible to describe. Well, said, she said, I suppose it can't be easy to make such a poem. But I doubt it's impossible. Perhaps, yes, perhaps the smallest sip of the kettle of Odre would give me the lyrical skills to conjure your beauty from generations still to come, he suggested. His sobs ceasing. Yes, perhaps it would, but it would have to be the smallest of smallest sips. Show me the kettle, and I will show you just how small a sip I can take. Gunlord unlocked the door, and in the moment she and Bovagil were standing in front of the kettle and the two vats. The smell of the mead of poetry was he. Just the tiniest of sips, she told him, for three poems about me that will echo down through the ages. Of course, my darling, Bovikir grinned in the dark. If she had been looking at him then, she would have known something was wrong. With his first drink, he drank every drop of the kettle. Oh, there is. With his second, he drained the vat called Bowden. With his 
Chance, you know.